most scariest thing one could ever face in this worldly life. If you are to really think about it, what is the scariest thing that could ever happen to you? The answer is that you're left in seclusion or that you're left in a place where you don't know anyone. That is perhaps the most scariest thing that could happen to any one of us. That you're left somewhere and you have no idea where you are. You have no idea where you're headed. You have no one. There is no one on the left or right or in front of you. There's absolutely nothing. You've gone somewhere new, totally new. And you know, when I used to live in, in Medina and I used to travel between Mecca and Medina, uh, it was a trip that we used to take. Obviously, it was either with the friends or with the family, whatever it is. But once I did that trip alone and it was at night and it's about four hour drive. And all these thoughts uh, start coming to your mind. What if the car breaks down now? What if the headlight was to, to burn out and it doesn't work anymore? And you're left somewhere, you've got no idea where you are, no direction, it's so dark, even if you put your hand outside, you can't see it, there's no street lights. There is absolutely nothing. So this is a really terrifying thing for, for someone to happen. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal, one of His blessings and mercy and bounty upon the people is that He makes us live among one another. That He makes us live, live among one another. And really, to be honest about it, when you really think about it, being left in seclusion or being left alone or being somewhere where you have no idea where you are is something really, really scary for anyone to, to experience. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to tie it with the topic. I want to begin with this ayah that I feel like and I believe it is the most comforting ayah in the Quran. This is Qawlihi Ta'ala in Surah Fussilat in where he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Allah Azza wa Jal is saying in this ayah that those who said رَبُّنَا Allah, those from among the believers, the people from among humanity, those who said رَبُّنَا Allah, they said our Lord is Allah. Allah didn't say إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اللَّهُ رَبُّنَا They said رَبُّنَا Allah. What that implies is that exclusively and only, only our master is Allah, no one else. We're going to submit all our will and we're going to submit everything for him alone and no one else. Qalu Rabbuna Allah, meaning they said La ilaha illallah, they said Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, and they had a, a belief in their heart. Not only that, Thumma istaqamu, then after believing and accepting that there is no Lord except him, and that there is no master except him. This is another name for Allah is Ar-Rabb. Ar-Rabb means the master. And when you think of Allah as a master, on the opposite side, you have a slave. When you have a master, you have a slave. When you have a teacher, automatically you know that they're students. So they said the Rabbun Allah, in other words, they automatically knew he's the master. Automatically they think of themselves as a slave. And they act like a slave should act. You know, now in worldly life, if there's a master and a slave, how does this slave act towards the master? He's always scared of him. He's always doing what he tells him. He's always doing more things to please him. Maybe that he frees him one day. So they accept Allah as a master and they acknowledge that they're the slave and they act as a slave should act. Not only that, after they've said La ilaha illallah and they've enslaved themselves to Allah, ثم استقاموا. Then they stand upright. Istaqamu comes from the word qama. And qama means to stand straight. And what that means is that they, straight, they stand straight upon la ilaha illallah. And standing straight upon la ilaha illallah means that they do what Allah Azza wa Jal wants them and orders them to do. So they pray, they fast, they give their zakat, they do their hajj, they're, they're, they're dutiful to the people, to their parents, and all the other good deeds that you can think of. That is istaqamu. So this is a powerful combination Allah teaches us. He's teaching us that it's not enough to say La ilaha illallah and then just uh, rely on this to admit you to the paradise. They say La ilaha illallah and straight after it, thumma, meaning exactly straight after, istaqamu. They stand straight upon this word and they act according to this word. And you can see that in their actions. So qalu rabbun Allah is their words. ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا is their actions. Now, what happens to them? The ulama say that this ayah, in particular, it's speaking about those who said رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا when they come to die, during the time of death. And you know, during the time of death, when one is going from one world to another, 
it's as scary as the first picture I gave you at the beginning. Because you're going somewhere where you don't know. You're going somewhere that you have no idea what's going on there. And, you know, moving from this life to another is exactly that same ID that we gave at the beginning. You're going somewhere and you have no ID where you're going. It's very scary. It's a dark place. It's a place you have never, ever been there before. This is the first time after how many years you've lived on this earth that you're going there. No one's ever told you in detail what you're going to expect there. And, uh, and there's just scare and there, there's fear in your heart. So Allah Azza wa Jal, He comforts the believers. This is why I said this is the most comforting ayah. Why? Because those who said, Rabbun Allahu thumma staqamu, at the time of death, they're not left alone. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, Tatanazzalu alayhimu al-malaika. Angels descend upon them. Now He said the word Tatanazzal. He didn't say Tanazzalu al-malaika. You know, in Surah Al-Qadr, there is Tanazzalu al-malaika tu ruhu fiha. But here, there's something different. There's Tatanazzal. This word has two ta. And what this implies is that groups upon groups of angels come down. Not just one group of angels like in Laylat al-Qadr. One huge group comes down and then they go back up. But the believer as he dies, the angels tatanazzal. Group after group after group of angels coming down to comfort this person that is about to leave this world and go to a really scary place where he's never been before and he's never known anything in detail about that place. They come down. Why do they come down for? تتنزل عليهم upon them they descend upon them it's like a tranquility has immersed upon them ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا the role of these angels are to come down to this believer to say to him لا تخافوا don't be afraid ولا تحزنوا and don't be grieved don't be sad well, what's the difference between don't be don't fear don't be don't fear and don't be sad you see, لا تخافوا, meaning they're telling, they're telling them, don't fear the future. Because fear is always associated with the future. You don't fear what's in the past. You're sad about what's the past, but you fear about the future. Like, you know, you fear about your future, you fear about your, your money, the future, you fear about your children, their future. Fear is always associated to the future. So the angels are telling these believers, who, by the way, said, رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا now they're coming down and comforting them, saying to them, لا تخافوا. Don't fear what is to come in the future. What is going to come in the future for this believer? His soul's going to come out. He's going to be put in this grave. He's going to be resurrected on the day of judgment. He'll stand on a day where the sun is a mile away from the heads of the people and it's so hot. All this is the future of him. And they're telling him from now, لا تخافوا. From now, don't fear. وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا And don't be sad. Don't be sad. And you know, what is a, a sadness and grief is associated to something that is in the past. So in other words, لَا تَحْزَنُوا means don't worry about what you're leaving in this worldly life. Your children, your money and all that, don't worry about it. Allah Azza wa will take care of it and will take care of your children just like it took care of you. Don't worry, you're ready to go now. لَا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوعَدُونَ and the role of these angels are not finished yet. So they tell this believer as he's dying, as his soul is coming out, Abshiru bil Jannah. You know, we're going to congratulate you with a paradise that has been always promised for the believers. Allati kuntum tu'adun that you have always been promised. Abshiru. Abshiru congratulating news. And you know, this is a this basically indicates to the fact that these believers were people who always used to read about the paradise and they always used to long for it. So now it's news that is congratulating to them. And you know, when one congratulates you on good news, then that means it's something that you always look forward to. So we're learning from this part of the ayah that part of the life of a believer is to always look forward to what Allah has promised him and to always long for it. And if, you're all, if you've had the paradise in between your eye and you always work towards it, then on that day when you die and the angels tell you Abshiru bil Jannah, now you'll really feel what it means. As opposed to someone who just lived this life and really didn't care and when he is about to die now he's sort of يعني, is thinking about how to be right. 
How is this person going to receive the news of the paradise and feel like it's a congratulating news for him? If he never, if he never even had it in his sight or in his vision. So Abshiru bil Jannah is implying that these believers are people who always read about the paradise. And they always have the paradise in front of them and they always work towards it. That you are promised. And you know, my dear brothers, I say to you in this point, that when you are certain that Allah has promised you the paradise, you will live a happy life. You, until you're certain and you're convinced that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised the believers a paradise, you will never see sadness in your life, you'll only see happiness. I'll give you an example. You know, let's say there was a father and the only family he had was a son. And this father had $500 million. And the son was really poor and the son is married and he's got five kids and they're, they're struggling. They're really struggling, poor. And the father dies. So the only one that will inherit the father is who? The son. He's going to get $500,000. But he's not going to get it instantly. There has to be... Uh, process has got to go through court and so on. Things got to be sold. And then after a year, he'll receive 500,000 in cash. Now that son that is poor, that has lived a miserable life, from the moment he's told your 500 is coming a year after he lives happily, he's happy. You will not see any sadness on him. Why? Because he knows that his money is going to come in a year's time. The believer al-a'la is the same. That when you're convinced Allah has promised the believer the paradise. No matter what kind of situation you're in, you're always happy. Until you meet that fate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He admits you to the paradise. And the first stages of it is when you die. It's not a really far thing. It's, it's very close. The moment you die, you'll experience it. وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوْعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ and as the angels are still comforting this person, they're saying to him, نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ We're your supporters. We help you out in this worldly life وفي الآخرة and everything that is to come after this worldly life. You know, imagine that now. You're stranded in a desert. Your car just uh, you only broke down and you're stranded. Somewhere you're left isolated and you got no ID. And groups and groups of people come and comfort you and tell you, come, come, sit down and we'll feed you and we'll give you and we'll provide for you. We'll give you a compass and we'll show you direction and how to manage your way out of here. Immediately you're comforted. That's the life of a believer when he's dying. He's immediately comforted by angels coming down to tell him about what's going to happen after his death. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We're your friends. We're your loyal friends in this worldly life. And don't think we're going to leave you here. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ and even after you die, we're going to have that trip with you as well. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ And then and from then, as he's dying, they're telling him over there, when you get there to the paradise, you're going to have whatever you want. مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ Whatever your nafs desires. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ And you'll have everything that you ever ask for. All of it will be given to you. And you know, subhanAllah, how the Qur'an, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he changes what's frightening and what's scare, what people are scared of, which is death. He changes it into the most comforting situation that could ever happen to a believer. The most exciting moment. You read these ayat and you understand them. It's as though now you're looking forward to death. You're looking forward to dying for this amazing moment that angels come down in groups and are comforting you to the next world. Subhanallah. And you know, let's just really think about this. If you were to, to go to the cemetery, and you just look at a grave. I really, you need to do this. Sometimes you really need to do this, get out of this, this world and this politics and what happens left and right. And you need to just go and you need to look at this grave and you need to understand that one day you'll end up there. But before you think about that, look at this grave and ask yourself this question. Why is it so frightening? Why are you scared of that hole? Look at it and really answer yourself, why are you scared of the hole? So you look at it, perhaps you're scared because it's tight. It is, it is really tight. And it only fits for one person, that's all. Then what else is scary? That when you see the truck, he rolls the, uh, the, the soil and the dirt above, that it gets even really tighter. And then it's really dark. That's another thing that people are worried about, it's darkness. And then not only this, there's, there's no windows, there's no opening, there's nothing. It's just like that forever. 
you know, until Allah Azza wa Jal raises you up. So it's very concerning and very frightening because of those things. Not only that, add to that loneliness. There's no one there. It's you and, and your deeds and that's it. No one else. Okay. For the life of a believer, when you think of these three things, it's tight, it's dark, and it's lonely. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith, as for the believer, you wassa'u lahu fi qabrih. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that as for the believer, his grave would be, they will, they, he, his grave would be open, it will be extended. Madda basari, as far as the eyesight can see. Now you know, it's, it's not a really, it's not a thing that you can do here in this room. But if you go to the cemetery, where there is no high-rise buildings, there's no tall buildings, it's just graves and a bit of uh, trees, you'll appreciate what this hadith means. Meaning stand on top of a grave and look around you. Everything you can see as far as the eye can see, that is the size of the grave. For a believer, only for a believer. You know, the tightness of the grave, that, that's for valimir, that's for usad, that's for people who didn't repair. That's for sinners. It's not for believers. It shouldn't worry you. If you're a true believer and someone who said, Rabbun Allah, thumma staqamu, you shouldn't worry about the tightness of the grave because the believer's grave is open. It's extended as far as the eye can see. Worried about its gloominess, about its darkness. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, as for the believer, you know waru lahu fi qabri. The grave, it's illuminated. Light gets into this grave. Light that is even stronger and brighter than the sun. And you know this light, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us, where do you get it from? As-salatu nur. The prayer is nur, the prayer is light. So the more prayer you have in this worldly life, the more you're illuminating the grave. وَيُنَوَّرُ لَهُ فِي قَبْرِهِ Then the loneliness, the issue with the loneliness. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, the believer... A man will come to him in the grave. He'll walk to him. A man that looks beautiful, that smells beautiful, that is wearing the most beautiful of clothing, and the believer that's in the grave would say, Man ant, who are you? Your face only comes with good news. Who are you? So he says to him, Ana amaluka salih. I'm your righteous good deeds. This is a sahih hadith in Muslim. All of them. And he sits with you until the day of judgment. So there is no loneliness, there's no tightness, there's no darkness for a believer. That house under the earth would be much better than any house you're going to build above this earth. But the way you build that house is different, it's spiritually. It's with your salat, it's with your Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal calls the Qur'an Nur, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٌ مُبِينٌ One of the names of the Qur'an is Nur, meaning the more you read, and the stronger the relationship you have with the Qur'an, the more light there is in the grave, the more a'mal salihah, the more good deeds, you know? And what, what we learn from this is you need to start working. You need to start working. Because those who receive that news are only for people who said, Rabbun Allah, thumma staqamu. And you know, this person gets so excited in the grave, he says, Rabbi aqim is sa'a, Rabbi aqim is sa'a. He screams it out. My Lord, hasten the hour, hasten the hour. Get things moving because I want to get out and meet my, my, my place. Not only that, the believer in the grave, the hadith mentions that for the believer, يُفْتَحُ لَهُ بَابٌ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ A door is open and يَرَى مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ He sees his place in the paradise. وَيَأْتِيهِ مِنْ رِيحِهَا And from the breeze of the paradise, it, it gets to him as in his grave. And not only that, the... the the bottom of the grave, his bed, يُفْرَشُ لَهُ فِرَاشٌ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ You know, subhanAllah. The bed that he sleeps on isn't that dirt. It's from material, it's carpet, it's whatever from the paradise. That's what's put underneath him and he rests on that until the day of judgment. Until the hour, the, until the resurrection. SubhanAllah. So what becomes so, so fearful, what becomes really scary and fright, frightening Allah Azza wa Jal changes that for the believer. It, this becomes one of the most comfortable things, one of the most happiest lives that a person will enjoy. That he's leaving this worldly life and going into Hayat al-Barzakh. That's the enjoyment he has under there. What do you think of the enjoyment it is when he comes out of that grave 
and he, and he actually finally ends up sitting in his place in the paradise. But contrary to that is the usat, the sinners, the wrongdoers, those who don't, uh, those who don't repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah called not repenting a crime. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُبْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Those who don't repent, they're the wrongdoers. You know, and it is these people that their, their grave remains tight and it remains dark. Not only that, يُفْتَحُ لَهُ بَابٌ مِنَ النَّارِ A door of the hellfire would open and a breeze from the fire, the heat waves from the fire would come to him. And you know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that اشْتَكَتِ uh, النَّارِ the hellfire complained to Allah. It said, Rabbi akala ba'di ba'da. It says, Oh Allah, a part of me ate another part. So then Allah Azza wa Jal gave it permission to have two breaths in the in the year. One of its breaths happens in summer and one happens in winter. So then the Prophet says, the most intense heat you feel in summer, that is from the breath of Jahannam that Allah gave permission to it. Well, that's just one day you'll experience. So if this is the hottest day, they say then that is coming from Jahannam through the sun. It's coming through the sun. And for a disbeliever, for a wrongdoer, for those who do not repent from their sins, that is just one day in Jahannam. And over and over and over again, it will keep coming inside like this. So you choose whether you want this or you want that cool breeze of Jannah to come. And the only way you achieve this is, رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُ Accepting that Allah Azza wa Jal is your master, enslaving yourself to him the way a slave should be to his master, always afraid of him and have some hope and do extra things so he can be pleased. Then they stand upright to La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is not a joke in their life. They work towards this word, word, word until they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he gives them this good news. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the believers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of the paradise, among those who receive their book in their right hands on the, in the, on the day of judgment. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. Alhamdulillahi wahdah wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'dahu wa ba'd. My dear brothers, I just wanted to conclude, inshallah, five, six minutes of your time. Uh, something different to the first khutbah, and that is yani, about uh, current uh, current events and currently what is happening. But I, I didn't get too much in politics and analyze. I don't like this. Is that's not part of my uh, style when giving khutbah and lessons. But I wanted to say one thing. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reveals in the Quran stories of the past, and you need to understand some of the stories of the past that were revealed. The first audience that heard them were the Sahaba with the Prophet And most of these stories came down relevant to the time of the Sahaba. So the Sahaba around the Prophet were being oppressed, were being mocked at, were being tortured, were being, يعني, all kind of crazy things were happening to these Sahaba. And Allah would reveal stories of the past. What was the purpose of them to comfort these believers? To say to them that, look, you're not the first people to experience what you're experiencing. Others before you experience the very same thing. So with these stories, the whole point of them is to comfort a nation, is to comfort a society who has been overwhelmed by lots of pressure from the outside, or lots of uh, mockery, uh, lots of oppression, lots of ridicule. These stories, that's their purpose. I'm going to share with you just one. This is uh, in Surah Al-Buruj, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the story of the criminals, Ashab Al-Ukhdud. They committed a, a huge, horrible crime. Ashab Al-Ukhdud, they dug ditches and they grabbed the believers and they threw them in there and they lit them on fire and they made them suffer and burn. And Ash-Shawkani Rahimahullah, he says that these ayat, Qutila Ashab Al-Ukhdud means may the people of the Ukhdud be cursed. Uh, Ash-Shawkani, he says that this ayah, and these stories are not only referring to the original Ashab al-Ukhdud, it is actually a reference to every single person that does the likes of Ashab al-Ukhdud. So anyone that commits this mass crime, this genocide, this collective graves of just throwing people inside and then bombing them or, or just uh, you know, destroying them or burning them alive or whatever it is, then they have that same, that same curse. And anyone that comes towards the believing nation we're speaking about, because these were criminals that were attacking the believers. Anyone that does this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives some very important points. He says, 
قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود. But then Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us what was the reason for why the disbelievers, what was the reason for why they mocked the believers? And why did they poke fun at them? And why did they make them a, a, a sort of a part of ridicule? Why? Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُ That they, the only thing that they found detesting in the believers, and listen to this very carefully, Naqamu comes from the word niqmah. Niqmah means to be disgusted by something, right? You're disgusted by something. It doesn't necessarily mean something good or bad. It's just something you just hate in someone. Like let's say someone walked in with a pink sock and you just hate the fact that he's wearing it. That's niqmah. He didn't do anything to you, but you're just disgusted by something. So Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that the disbelievers, when they wage their attack on believers, the only reason they do it what is the thing they found detesting? What is the thing they found disgusting with the believers? Is it their beard? Is it their thawb? Is it their scarf? What was it? Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ That's all. The only thing they found detesting with us is أَيُؤْمِنُوا That they commit and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all. Nothing else. Not your, not your looks, not your beard, not where you pray, not how you pray, they don't care about that. They only care about what's inside here. And that is that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only that, إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ Everyone, a lot of people can believe in Allah. That's, that's simple. And I can go out and convince anyone. And the mushrikun believed in Allah. You know, a lot of disbelievers believe Allah created everything. But no, the believer went further. إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ and two very important names of Allah have been highlighted. Al-Aziz, Al-Hamid. I want you to understand these very carefully why Allah put them in this ayah as opposed to all the other names he has. Al-Aziz, the legislator, the lawmaker. So the only thing they found disgusting with the believers is that they believed in Allah, but not any kind of Allah. A Lord that is Al-Aziz, the one who puts the law, the one who makes the law. The legislator, that is Al-Aziz. Al-Hamid is the one who deserves all praise. And you know, back in the time, the king, he destroyed the believers. Why? Because he wanted to be Al-Aziz. He wanted to have the law and he wanted to put the law down. And the believers didn't respect that. So they burnt them on the fact that they believed in someone else that is Al-Aziz. And not only that, Al-Hamid. Al-Hamid is the one who deserves all praise. And you know, the king back in the time and the kings of all those times until now, they want Al-Habid for themselves. They want people to praise them. We made this for you and we provided this hospital for you and these roads for you. We can thank that, Alhamdulillah, yes. But eventually all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is his name, Al-Hamid. So until you really believe in the name of Allah Al-Aziz, then there is no really testimony of Iman inside of you. Al-Aziz, Al-Hamid. And this is what Allah Azza wa Jal told the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is with such an ayah that the believing nation was comforted. So that Allah was telling him, you're not the first people to endure this pain. People much before you, because they said the same thing, experienced the same thing. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's psychology with the Sahaba was amazing. Khabbab would come to him and complain, Ya Rasulullah, look at my master, Umm al Nawr, what she's doing with me. She gets a pot, she lights it on fire, she gets a rod, she puts it in there. She makes sure that the tip of the rod is red hot, and then she irons my back with it. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't tell him, Usmir, remain patient, don't worry. He takes him somewhere else. He says to him, what much before you people were, were punished even worse than this. So in other words, he wants him to compare his situation with the past. And that when you acknowledge that the past was much more difficult, and he tells him that people would be sawn in half with the saw. He compares it and he says, I'm going through nothing. And what I wanted to just point out on this is that you compare your situation, what you're living in, to the past. You'll really find it. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's nowhere near in the past. And if they were committed on their deen and Allah Azza wa Jal promised them the paradise, then this is the very same thing that should happen to us. Alhamdulillah, things are, are as they are. And we thank Allah Azza wa Jal and He, Allah Azza wa Jal, takes care of His believers and He takes care of yani, His righteous servants. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from our own.